Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. Cause you are good, you're good. You're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, you are good, you're good, oh, and let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails. You're good. Oh, oh, sorry about that. Got caught mid warble. Good morning, everybody. It is good to see the family coming aboard and joining with this morning. Let's see. Let's get that up there, and uh, we will move forward. Miss Carolyn, first up today. Wahoo! Good to have you here. Nice to see you up there. Glad your computer's working. All right, Miss Ruth Ann is there, right? close behind you. We love you, Miss Ruth. And there's my sweetie saying, good morning, dear brothers and sisters. Welcome to our family gathering. And it is, isn't it? Alicia, Cam, Kara, Cody, God bless. It's good to see. And I like those kissy faces out there. So uh, good morning to you guys too. Donna, good morning. Thank you for letting us know Terry got home late last night. Yay! And, uh, well, maybe she'll get up and pop in with us where we can say hi to her personally. Went to her gra twin grandson's graduation. Posted pictures there out there, uh, and I'm glad she had such a good time. All right, let's go ahead and continue. We're moving you know, deeper into this book. We're in the 10th chapter, uh, and uh, you know, uh, we're being instructed, uh, really, on practical wisdom for life how to live a wise life in a practical sense of the word. 
Uh, I love the way that he opens uh, this 10th chapter. He, he says, uh, dead flies make a perfumer, perfumer, perfumer's oil stink. So a little foolishness is weightier than wisdom and honor. Of course, what he's relating to is just a, a not to play with folly because even a little bit can ruin your reputation. It doesn't take much to destroy a lifetime of good work, a lifetime of hard work. It just takes going down folly lane. Uh, you know, and, and we all go there and understand that. You know, it's part of the human experience. We are drawn into sinful activity. We willingly, uh, volitionally make those choices. And uh, they always carry consequences. And sometimes they can be severe. Sometimes uh, that misjudgment, that uh, that unwise decision, that uh, uh, that that act, can ruin so much of the good and hurt so many uh, around us. Uh, remember, I said folly's like that drop of arsenic in your coke. Uh, doesn't take very much uh, within your coke to kill you. Uh, doesn't take many bed bugs reproducing in your brand new mattress. To, uh, to destroy you know, that, that pleasure. Uh, the second thing is that, uh, that I shared yesterday is that folly will always take us in a bad direction. We're going to pick up on that a little bit more this morning when we get you know, into the lesson to, uh, to, to kind of get you to see how this all fits together with some New Testament teaching as well. Uh, he says, a wise man directs his heart toward the right and a foolish man directs his man's heart directs his heart, uh, heart directs him toward the left. We're not, again, talking political right and left. We're talking about righteousness and sin. We're talking about uh, holiness and, and folly. We're talking about the difference, the two extremes between uh, living a righteous life and the opposite of that is to live a, a, a wanton life, if you will, a life of sin. Uh, the third thing that he tells us is folly affects all of our decisions, which means it cannot be hidden. Every decision you and I make carry with the consequences. Good morning, Miss Sue. It's good to see you there. It always carries every every decision we make, good or bad, are going to carry uh, corresponding co consequences, either some good consequences or bad. And by the way, you can uh, make the right decision, the best decision, the wise decision, and sometimes because of the world which we live in, those consequences can seem to be bad. But even that which comes to the one who is walking righteousness, even if it seems to be uh, a, a bad consequence or a bad outcome, God has a purpose in it. Uh, he knows what he's doing in it. You know, uh, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer stood up against the communist oppression, or not communist, Nazi oppression during World War II. He made the right decision. He did the same, the right things. He was living righteously and wisely. He went back to Germany to minister to people going through that terrible time. Because he was in America at the time all of this broke loose. He was arrested, though. Bad outcome for, for a righteous decision. And ultimately hanged before he, you know, just days before uh, he could be rescued by the Allies. So you see, but. That horrible consequence to a right and righteous decision led to hundreds of thousands of people coming to faith in Christ over the years as they've read his work, as he has been raised up as a martyr of the faith. Uh, uh, so, you know, we need to understand these things. Every decision we make, good or bad, are going to carry consequences. Bad decisions generally come out with very bad consequences. I don't know many good consequences that come out of bad decisions. But in, in one respect, you could say every righteous, uh, wise decision made by a righteous man got to bear its consequences too. So uh, just like wisdom, uh, folly has its consequences. And we need to determine what will direct our steps. Will we be God-directed and live a God-directed life, a Christ-directed life, or will we be living a self directed life. Now that's where I want to pick up. And, you know, I'm going to share with you after prayer when we come back, uh, we're going to explore the characteristics of both a Christ-directed, a God-directed life, and a self-directed life. And using what may for some of you be a familiar uh, uh, illustration, 
but uh, for others, it may bra be brand new. You may never have seen this before. So, you know, let's move forward. Father, I want to thank you so very much for the love that you pour out on us. I thank you, Lord, when we were helpless to do anything about our own sinful state. You know, Lord, you stepped into the picture. You sent your only son to be the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but for the whole world. And you shed your love abroad in our heart. And we thank you for that. God, we could not live the day, live the moment without you. You are the giver of life. Life is in you. And Lord, you have chosen by the grace of God through your ultimate mercy to pour that life out in each of us. We love you with all of our heart and pray, Lord, that you will open our minds and our heart. Give us eyes to see, Lord, ears to hear. And Lord, I pray you will open up our heart to receive from you the very word, the principles, the, the power, the, the direction that your word gives to our life. Make it the living word of God in us, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's let's uh, move a little bit further into this idea of a Christ-directed uh, or, or self-directed life. Now, what I'm going to be using is an illustration that may be familiar to some. If you've ever seen the four spiritual laws, you you see it in that, and uh, it is a uh, uh, a tool developed by uh, Bill Bright, who was the founder and president uh, until his death of uh, Campus Crusade for Life. I use generally I have three different kinds of illustrations I use when I'm discipling people and helping them to understand what a, a uh, what the Christian life, the life of a disciple, the uh, the the life of, of the believer in on, on a journey before God. Uh, you know, all of these things. Navigators put out the nav wheel, the navigator's wheel, years and years ago. D D Dawson Troutman developed that. Avery Willis put together the, the Disciples' Cross, which I use, uh, especially in my beginning phases of, of working with and, and discipling people on what it is, what are the four disciplines of the Christian life and how they work with Christ at the center of the life. And I also use this illustration because it's a graphic that helps us, you know, you know hone in on this, you know, very well. So I pray that uh, you'll follow along with this, and it won't be boring, but it'll be really informational for you, and and it'll be exploratory and self-exploratory to you as well. Uh, it'll help you see not only yourself, but it also helps you to discern, if you will. Uh, to you know, to to look with an eye of wisdom as we look at the world around us. Uh, so first of all, let's look at the uh, uh, the, the self-centered life. Okay, this is a person who lives his or her life as if God has no relevance to them whatsoever. In fact, the things of God seem absolutely foolish to them. And, of course, this is what Paul says to the church in Corinth in the second chapter, the 14th verse, when it says that the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. He doesn't have the mechanism within him to receive these things with understanding because what is necessary to understand and receive these things is something that is void in their life. If you look at the uh, illustration, in each one of these you'll have a circle. Okay, That circle speaks about your life, anybody's life, but your life or my life. Okay? And, and uh, it speaks of the life of every person, you know, individually in this world. And what you find is in the center of life, what Bill used was a, a chair or a throne, okay? Who is going to be enthroned in your life? Well, in the self-directed life, in the life of the natural man, uh, you know, self is, you know, right there. It is in the center of the life. It is the, the master of your own fate. You are in control. You are directing everything in your life. Uh, all the interests, all the activities that you're involved in are directed by self, uh, residing, uh, uh, resulting in, in, in discourse and frustration and vanity.
All right, let's just put it this way. Put it in Solomon's word. The result of that, no net worth, it's like chasing the wind, and all is vanity. And the, the reason for that is, if you'll notice, the cross represents Christ, and Christ is outside the life, which is why they don't have the capacity to understand or receive the things of the Spirit of God because they are spiritually apprised. It takes a mechanism inside us to be able to open to us an understanding of the things of God. Remember, uh, Paul is talking, and, and, and he says that you know in, in that first chapter, I has not seen, ear has not heard what God has in store for those who love him. And then he talks about the fact that no man knows the heart of any man. I don't know what is in the heart of any person. You know, God knew the heart of every man. Jesus knows the heart of every man, but I don't. Okay? Only the man himself understands what's in his own heart. And the same with God. No man can understand the things of God unless he has the Spirit of God within him because the Spirit of God uh, makes understandable uh, you know, everything there is of God. And it is the Spirit of God that shows us what the mind of God, the heart of God, is all about. But the natural man doesn't have that Spirit of God living within him. So there is no receptacle. Have you ever tried to talk to somebody about their relationship with God and have them look at you like a cow looks at a new gate? Now, for those of you guys that are young, and you may not, or, or city-dwelling folks that don't know what that means, cattle, when they, if you've ever been in the country, you see a cattle guard out there, uh, you know, as you cross over, you know, onto some property, there's this uh, metal uh, uh box, if you will, that you drive over, it's called cattle guard. Because you see cattle come right up to that, but they'll never cross it. You leave the gate open, but they're never going to cross that cattle guard. All right? So, you know, that's the expression, you know, you know, you know they, they, they look at you like a cow looking at a cattle guard. What are you talking about? Where are you going? What does this thing mean? Because there is not that within them. Uh, or they say, oh, you know, what you're talking about, it's just foolishness. Of course it is foolishness to them. I never understood why it is that we as believers think that non-believers ought to think like believers ought to think. I want you to think about what I just said there. It, it, it may sound like a circular argument, but it, it really is not. How many of us look at the, the unbeliever, the natural man in this world, acting the way they are, and we think, why in the world are they acting like that? Why are they doing that? You know, we came out of two years of, of riots and, and, and ugly stuff still going on in our country. We scratch our head and wonder, you know, why? And we can you use, But the truth of the matter is we should expect lost people to act like lost people. You know, that's the truth of it. You know, I, I, I got to tell you, you can get a lost person cleaned up and he thinks he's a pretty righteous person, but that doesn't make him saved. The only thing that brings life into the life of that person is when, when Christ, that cross, moves into the life. The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. All right? And, you know, he can't understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But then look what happens when you come to a Christ-directed life. Now, a Christ-directed life is, is uh, uh, someone who uh, has, has you know, invited Christ into the life. Here, I got the right one up there. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 through 16, it says, But he who is spiritual, pneumontica, one who has the Spirit residing in him. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is, not a, is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he would instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ? Now, this Christ-directed life is one in whom they've accepted, they've received Christ. For as many received him, to them he gave the authority, the power to become the children of God. Not born of the will of man, nor born of the flesh, but born of the will of God. All right? So this is a person who has laid their life down to Christ, 
Christ has picked their life and got moved into them. He is now the Lord of the life, and Christ sits upon the throne of the life. He's in the center of the life. We have dethroned ourselves. Self is off the throne. Christ is on the throne. You'll see where self is. Self is in a subservient position to God. Christ is on the throne. His, the person's interests are directed by Christ, resulting in harmony with God's plan, resulting in the ability to live and walk wisely, righteously, holily, uh, in holiness in this world. Self has yielded itself to, to Christ. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, the first part of chapter 10, the first part of verse 2 says, the wise man's heart directs him toward the right. Now, what is happening here? Well, the wise man is, is a God-directed man, a God who has Christ at the very center and core of his life. He has yielded his will to Christ's will. Now, some spiritual traits that result from trusting God are, are real simple. It, it's Christ-centered. It trusts God. You know, to direct his path, it obeys God. If you love me, you'll obey me. It lives under the control and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, following Paul's uh, admonition to us to not be drunk with wine, for in such is sex as. But be ye continually being filled with the Spirit. All right? So it is that person who is yielded up and now is being controlled and empowered, like, like too much alcohol controls and empowers an individual in, in really stupid ways, the Holy Spirit comes. And remember on the day of Pentecost, when you read that, everybody thought they were drunk. Why? Because they just seemed to be out of control. They seemed to be different. But Paul Peter says, these people aren't drunk on wine like you, 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 you suppose. No, see what time of day it is. They're not drunk on wine. No, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the promise that God has promised us. So they were under the, the, empower, the control and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. It means that they abide in the Word and that the Word abides in them, in him or in her. Uh, they have a, a, an effective prayer life. They make wise decisions based on God's Word, and they demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, which is simply love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. To, to, to name just seven of, of many that would, uh, they, they bear that fruit, the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of holiness, the fruit of witness, all of these things. This is the Christ-directed life, the God-directed life. To the degree to which these traits are manifested in my life or in yours depends on the extent to which we trust the Lord with every detail of our life. And we lay it upon the maturity that we develop in Christ. We are being built up, Paul says, to a spiritual man until we all come to the unity of faith. In a, another term that, that you can use for that is that, and you hear, you may have heard this term before. It was uh, being bantied around, you know, many years ago when I was uh, coming up, uh, young in the ministry. But is the crucified life? It is the life. Uh, 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 that that lives, you know, from the cross, if you will, lives from our position in Christ. It's also known as the exchange life. I'm exchanging my sinful life for His holy life. It is going to be Christ living in me, as Paul says in Galatians two twenty. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So it is the, it is the Christ-centered life, the God-centered life, the crucified life, the exchange life that we're talking about, where Christ is in absolute authority, reigning and ruling from the very throne of our own heart. Now, why is it that most Christians don't experience that kind of abundant, overflowing Christian life? Well, that's because they come to what what uh, what Paul or what uh, Solomon talks about in the second part of that second verse, you know, and the uh, the fool, you know, his heart directs him, you know, to the left, directs him to uh, to the opposite of where righteousness goes. This is the self-directed life. 
All right, the self-directed life is also referred to by Paul as the carnal man, the carnal Christian. This is someone who has received Christ into their life. They they know him, well, they, they at one time obviously surrendered to his lordship. He is the savior. He is the lord of their life. Uh, he, uh, he is someone who has uh, received Christ, but on who lives in defeat because he's trying to live the Christian life on his own terms, in his own strength. So if you look at that diagram, it, it, it shows that uh, uh, you, know, you have that same circle, you have the same activities, and you have the, the same elements within that circle, but look at the difference. Who's on the throne of the life? You see, self has taken over control of the life again. Christ has been dethroned, as it were, in our life. We're not listening to him. We're not following his directions. We're not, uh, we don't have an active prayer life. We don't get in the word. We don't witness. All of these things that, that we had in the spirit, spiritual man's life, we no longer have because now we have this sec, uh, self-directed life. Interests uh, are directed by self and often results in discord and frustration and, and living a life no different than our lost friends. Christ is dethroned and not allowed to direct the life. Paul makes this distinction uh, also when he's talking to the Corinthian believers in the third chapter, verses 1 through 3. He says, I and I, brethren, do not speak to you as a spiritual man, but as to, a, as to carnal men, as to babes in Christ. Stop here a moment. Now, we're referred to often as, as uh, babes, like uh, newborn babes crave pure spiritual milk and so forth, all right? That's a legitimate illustration for the, the, the infant steps that we take, you know, in, in our Christian walk. But milk isn't there to sustain us throughout our life. We need the meat of the word as well. Well, this is a person who uh, is, is a babe. This, but this person is, is, is anything? Is there anything wrong with being a babe in Christ, being a brand new believer, being your first steps as a believer, like baby steps? Of course, it isn't. There is legitimate infancy in physical life, but I got to tell you, there's illegitimate infancy too. You know, when you were. Uh, one, two, three, four. You may throw tantrums and uh, act up and do all the kinds of things that, that uh, young children do. You make bad decisions, bad decisions. But you know, what if you're 18, 19, 20, 30, 40, and you're still throwing tantrums? You're still demanding your own way. You're still acting up. You're still... Uh, uh, making fully stupid decisions out of out of uh, emotional fervor. What then? Well, you're acting like a baby, but you see, you're not. You're you're a grown adult. So that activity is would be an illegitimate infancy in the life of a of a full blown adult. You know, I, I was at a store one time, and this this really happened. A uh, kid was throwing a, a, a fit in the store. Wanted this, wanted that. Mom kept saying no. Kid threw a, a, a classic, you know, scream, yell, you know, you know, stomp on the floor tantrum. Mom got tired of it. Pretty soon, mom's down on the floor, beating the floor, kicking her feet, and screaming like a child. The child is looking at her like this. But the message got across. How many of us know Believers who have been believers 10, 15, 20, 30 years. But they haven't grown any further in their Christian walk than when they first got saved. They may have seniority. They could have seniority in a church someplace and be in a position of leadership, but they are still yet ch children. They're carnal. This is what Paul's talking about. He's talking about people who saw themselves to be hyper, super uh, uh, spiritual, but what they really were, were nothing but immature believers, babes in Christ. I give you milk to drink, not solid food. Why? For you are not yet able to receive it. The writer Hebrews says, you know, you ought to be teachers yourself, but, but you're demanding and need to be taught the elementary principles. You should be mature by now, but you're not. 
<coughs> you can't stomach solid food, for you're not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you are not able, for you are still carnal. For since there are jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like the natural man, like mere man? In other words, you ought to be different. You ought to be mature believers, not acting like the natural man out there. When you see Christians that are acting out their life as if they don't know Christ, he hasn't made a difference in their life, their worldview is absolutely consistent with the worldview there. One of two things, they are either not a believer or they have slipped into deep carnality that Paul is talking about here. Good morning, Charlotte. It's so good to see you out there this morning. Now, the carnal man trusts his own judgment, uh, his own reasonings, his own effort to live the Christian life. He is either uninformed uh, or he's forgotten God's love and forgiveness and power. He has ended up uh, upside down in his Christian experience and he can't understand himself. He wants to do right, but he can't. And Instead of, of exploring why that is, he scratches his head and says, oh, well, I guess that's the way it's going to be. He fails to draw upon the power of the Holy Spirit to live the Christian life. Some or all of the following traits you know, may characterize the Christian who does not fully trust God. He's ignorant of his spiritual heritage. Uh, he's, he lives in discouragement disobedience, unbelief. You, 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 well, you know, that may be good for you, but it, it, it's not, you know, it, it doesn't work that way for me. Unbelief, disbelief, even as a believer, guilt, worry, jealousy. I mean, Paul's listed some of these. A critical spirit. You find somebody with a critical spirit, you're going to find somebody who is either not saved or they're living in that carnal state, no matter how spiritual they think they may be. No desire for, for really getting into the Word and applying the Word to their lives. A loss of love for God and for others. You'll usually find these people uh, on a couple of, 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 of areas. They're either super legalistic in their attitude, or they have themselves up on this great uh, platform because they are spiritual. Paul, when he starts this, he talks about them. I'd like to speak to you as spirit. Pneumon Tikon. In other words, there were people that thought they were hyper-spiritual. They looked down on everybody else. Had legalistic attitude. Impure thoughts. Poor prayer life. Frustration. Living aimlessly. This is the person that relates to Solomon's words in the second part of that 10th verse. Or 10th chapter. Uh, second verse, but the foolish man's heart directs him not to righteousness, but to unrighteousness, to the left. So as Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Now here's a question. Which of these people most represents your life? I pray you keep that. I'll certainly be willing to, to send it to you uh, and, and give those illustrations to you so you can have them if you want them. You know, let me know. I'll, I'll form a PDF and I'll, I'll email them out to anybody that wants them. But it's a great uh, a tool to look at my own life and even be able to judge how I make my decision. <coughs> Which of these people, natural, spiritual, or carnal, represents your life? Self, you know, self-possessed life, God-directed life, or self-directed life. Now, moving on with that, we could more easily move into to to point two that we had started yesterday. Didn't get too far into. Respond wisely to foolish words, you rulers. Those in your life who, who, who have authority over you learn, and, and if they're unwise, they're foolish, you still have to respond to them in wisdom. Verse 4 and 5 and 6, or 4, 5, 6, and 7. If the ruler's temple rises against you, do not abandon your position because composure allies great offenses. 
there is an evil I have seen under the sun, like an error which goes forth from a ruler. Folly is set in many exalted places while rich men sit in humble places. I have seen slaves riding on horses and princes walking like slaves on the land. So basically he's saying stay calm when they're angry. You know, just stay calm while they're angry. Don't, don't get upset. Keep a calm demeanor about you. If the ruler's temper rises against you, okay, I'll do that. Uh, I will sure do that. Uh, Carolyn wanted a copy, so I'm going to send her out a copy. Stay calm when they're angry. The ruler's temper rises against you. Do not abandon your position because composure allays great offenses. One of the places that we tend to find foolish people uh, is, is, is in government. I mentioned that to you yesterday. I'm not trying to be cynical. I, I'm really not, although we, we are getting much more jaded as the years go on. But if we were to be honest, we'd have to admit that the, uh, there's a lot of foolish decisions coming out of high places, and that would mean that there's a lot of people who fit into that category making those decisions. Now, how do you respond? How do you respond when you have that sort of thing happening in authority over you? How do you respond to when you, you know, for those of you that are still in the workforce, when you have a, a boss who really acts foolishly? And I've had many of those. First, you stay calm. You, you don't get mad. You don't respond in kind. You don't respond rashly or harshly. Have you ever been tempted to, uh, when you were in the workforce, to just quit a job because the boss blew up at you or something? Well, I've had bosses that got on my face and screamed and yelled and ran, threw things across the shop and, uh, you know, just, you know, temper tantrum from on high. And boy, there's been times I've been wanting to just pack up my knives, grab my box, and out the door I go and say, mail me my check. Solomon says, don't do that. Your boss isn't thinking clearly right now, but once he settles down, you know, things can work out. So keep your composure and hang in there while everybody else is losing theirs. Don't quit. And the com companion verse to that is in Proverbs 15 and verse 1. It says, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I got to tell you, that has proven true over and over in my life. The times that I responded in kind to what was being, what was coming at me, always blew up into something really ugly. But if I could get control of my own heart, let Christ calm me down and put me in that position where I, I do not, I, I, I speak, you know kindly and reverently and with respect. Many times I've, we've been able to go out after it and, and the individual who was throwing this adult-sized tantrum has said, listen, I'm sorry, just a bad day. I flew off the handle. I really overblew the, the situation, whatever. But if I respond in kind, that gives them the justification for any action that they may take. Now, these verses are important because it's easy to respond to anger with anger. It's easy to respond to gossip with gossip. It's easy to respond to mistreatment with mistreatment. One of the problems that I see an awful lot is somebody who bottles up all their frustration at work and they're not handling it, they don't know how to handle it, they go home and they take it out on the family. They, they kick the kids and kiss the dog, however you want to put it. You know, you know what I mean? I think every one of you can identify with what I'm saying unless you happen to be some of the younger in our crowd, and they will, as they grow up, understand these things, and if these principles are ingrained in them, perhaps they can uh, uh, miss a lot of the, the sorrow or pain that some of us in our lives have suffered with. You know, when you think to yourself, I don't have to take this, and then either fight back or give up and walk away, but Solomon says he doesn't recommend either course of action. Now, certainly this proverb isn't meant to apply to every single situation. If somebody's coming up and, they're getting, and, they, and they strike you or they're coming at you violently, you may have to respond in kind just to protect yourself or defend yourself. But I think you understand the difference. 
You see, there are times in which fighting back or walking away is the best course of action. But even then, a wise man will keep his cool, and he'll act rationally rather than emotionally. You know, so next, where we, okay, I can open this up, get used to the fact that life is not always fair. You know, I, I would come home sometimes, or, 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 you know, Sherry and I would talk about something going on, her job or my job, and it would come down to the conversation that, that this just isn't fair. And the truth of the matter is it probably wasn't. There were probably no fairness in it whatsoever. But another fact of life is that it's not always fair. There is an evil I have seen under the sun, like an error which goes forth from the ruler. Folly is set in many exalted places, while rich men sit in humble places. I have seen slaves riding on horses and princes walking like slaves on the land. Now, it's going to take a little bit more than the time that we have to completely unfold this thought. So what does Solomon observe under the sun according to this verse? Well, he observes fools being promoted and honored, while those who deserve it are ignored and passed over. How many of you out in the workplace got passed over for a promotion or a raise or something, and, and, and somebody that you knew was less qualified, that, uh, you know, maybe because they, uh, they knew how to schmooze the boss, because they fit in the same kind of pattern that the boss, they get promoted over you. How many of us have ever seen people who are deserving not get what they deserve, and the people who were undeserving get all the glory? Well, that's what Solomon's talking about here. What does he call him? He calls it evil, or a misfortune. But, but the word he uses is an evil. It's so bad yeah, you know, what 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 exactly is so bad about rich men rich men being overlooked for a promotion? Well, the rich man in this verse represents the person who is wise. They're rich in wisdom and they're capable. They're someone who is truly qualified for the job, whatever that job may be. He's not talking about wealth of money here. He's talking about wealth of righteousness, wealth that comes from wisdom, well, you know, that kind of wealth. Wealth that is truly wealth indeed. All right? We'll stop here. We'll take this section. We'll begin there after the overview tomorrow. We'll begin there, and we will unfold this, this incredibly salient point for our life. Get used to the fact that life just is not always fair. All right? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that that uh, in so many ways, in so many different places, we can, we can pull from the Word of God to show the absolute harmony within Scripture. Lord, I look at these things, and I see how, how Paul works this out uh, when he's talking to the church in Corinth, and how Solomon's worked it out, and I see, Lord, how everything is married and blended together, and that gives me the absolute confidence that this book was written by only one author. You use many pens to write it but only one author, and I thank you for that, Lord. You are glorious, you are stupendous, you are great beyond belief. Great is our Lord, and greatly, greatly to be praised. Lord, may you be honored in our time today. May it have been truly an experience of worship that we give to you, knowing that any understanding or insights we give is the work of the Holy Spirit within our lives. Thank you for being our teacher, our tutor, our guide for life. Lord, help us to go out today and keep our minds set on you and let the decision-making we do flow from the inner resources we have in Christ. Lord, we love you. Now, Lord, bless and keep us and use us as vessels of honor that you can pour out wherever you need us to be poured out. Thank you, Lord. In the name of our Lord, our Savior, our God, our King above all other kings, Jesus Christ, thank you. Amen and amen. I love you. I thank you all for being here today. I pray that you had uh well, just a great experience. God bless. Uh, Donna, I can send you a copy. Anybody else want a copy of, uh, 
uh, of that. I've got it in a discipleship folder that I used. I just I just shared it with somebody. I know you're out there today. So uh, that gives us a little further explanation I could give you that I couldn't give you the other day because of the time frame that we had. So you get that as well. But I thought it would be a great way when I, I'm looking in this verse to explain to you exactly what, what Solomon is saying and put it in the New Testament perspective you know, for our life that the uh, the heart of, of, of a wise man leads him to the right and the heart of a foolish man leads him in the opposite direction. May God bless you. Listen, I'll be back here at 6 tonight as we continue with looking at Christ in the Old Testament, We're looking at that Paschal Lamb. Come join us. We have another vision video clip for you. We have a time of prayer. So any prayer requests, make sure you get them up here and get them out. Betsy, yes, please, I can do that with you as well. Uh, so I have Carolyn, Donna, Betsy, and Ruth, all right? I will get those out to you. And I'll send one to Terry, too, because normally when she's in there, she asks for any hand. So, uh, and Sue, I will get one to you as well. May God bless you. Remember now, this isn't my my making. This isn't, this isn't coming. This, I, this is something that, uh, I got, you know, from, you know, studying, you know, and, and stuff that came from Bill Bright. It's out of Campus Crusade information, but I use it, uh, also with their permission. Of course, it's pretty well public knowledge anyway. So God bless you. I love you. And I'll send that out for you. All right. Have a great day. And I'll see you tonight at six and tomorrow back here at nine in the morning.